Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the data science session in SIXA conference. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the first keynote speaker of the session, Professor Roma McGuire. Uh, I have a pleasure working with Roma uh, at Strathclyde University. Roma is a professor of digital health and care at the University of Strathclyde and director of health and care future innovatives. She is also called the health technology cluster and hold an honorary nurse consultant post in digital health at NHS Lancashire. Her research interest includes digital health, remote patient monitoring, supportive care predictive modeling, and values-based medicine. She has significant experience in the co-design, development, evaluation, and implementation of person-centered remote patient monitoring system using patient respond, uh, patient reported outcome measures to optimize symptoms management, promote adherence to medicine, support well-being, and improve quality of life. A research spans several clinical specialty, including cancer, dementia cardiac and respiratory disease and palliative and life uh, of life care. She has led to several multi site supportive care and digital health studies in the UK and across the Europe. So Roma is going to give us a talk on citizen gender data potentials and challenges, which are very exciting. In her talk, she's going to talk about the talk, her talk will be focused on the presentation of the advancing the use of citizen generated data and artificial intelligence to optimize clinical decision making and enable the delivery of more personalized and targeted care. Roma, I'll hand it to you. Okay, um, thank you, Yasher. I'm just going to quickly share my screen. I hope that's. Uh, hey. Okay, um, so good, good morning everybody, a, a, a great opportunity to uh, present here today um, and as Yasher said the focus will be on citizen generated data potential and challenges and that's where a lot of my research is featured within the domain of digital health. So. I'm not a data scientist, I'm not a technologist. What I am, is, as Yasher said, is a health person who worked in the NHS um, for many years in different areas before moving into academia well over 10 years ago. Um, and actually my first role in academia was looking at um, digital health and, and remote patient monitoring. And as I say, that's a lot of the work that I've done today. So this is a very applied talk. It's talking about system generated data, um, set in the context what it is, what it can do. I'll use a few examples from my own um, research. And then at the end, we'll pose some questions for the health um, and data community about how we can go forward. Because what we do know is that system generated data has huge potential for healthcare. It can really actually act as a solution to many of the challenges that we're facing. Um, but we still are on a road um, to achieving that. Um, and it'd be good to present this work and then hopefully to have some discussion that will follow this. So just quickly setting the context, we have a growing and aging population. Um, we know that as people age, um, that they start to develop conditions. Um, and over the age of 70, by the time you're 80, you have at least five um, conditions, which is very hard for people to manage. They have five conditions, often lots of different medications. And when you look at things like self-care for each condition, it can actually create quite a burden, not only on the healthcare system, but on the individual. And this is where digital systems can actually maybe play a role in, in reducing the burden if, if designed appropriately. We knew, we know that even before COVID, we had an unprecedented demand in health and social care services. Um, and I think, my experience, you know, particularly over the past 20 years, is that when it comes to healthcare and, and just in our daily lives, we've just lived in a constant 
economic climate of instability um, and of austerity. And, that, and that's a challenge because health and care is a constant. It doesn't go away. Um, so I, with whether there's less money, we still have as many or more people to care for. And this does raise problems in terms of service delivery moving forward. We look at in the context of health system reform. So as I said, current models of care that are unsustainable. Um, a lot of our reforms are really looking at how do we decentralise from costly hospital settings to local settings? So how do we support people to remain well within their communities for as long as possible? Um, how can we focus more on the prevention of health or on um, extending the time to the point that a person does develop a disease? Um, and fo focus on promotion and well-being instead of illness. And this has actually been very hard within the healthcare setting, particularly just now. We can see COVID. We're having to be very, very reactive, deal with the here and now, and trying to get resource and time and headspace to really, really deliver this much more anticipatory model of care can be a challenge. And the future vision is that hospital-based care is the domain of the seriously ill. Um, and right now, that's not the case. We know there's still inappropriate um, admissions, we know that there's people in hospital beds that it's not the optimal environment for them. So we still have quite a way to go in enabling these system reforms for the future. And with COVID, um, we've had unprecedented demand, even more so now. We can see in our day-to-day -day lives, it's the impact is really phenomenal. It's very, very, very negative consequences of COVID. People are losing their lives, demand in health services, you know, um, focusing on COVID and what other things are we missing within the health and care domain. Um, but a positive of COVID, if there can be any positives, is that it has accelerated this digital transformation. Um, and actually, this is a quote from the, the King's Fund, um, where they say many previous barriers removed have been removed instantly and new ideas deemed too radical a couple of months ago are becoming our new normal. And that's definitely what we're seeing in healthcare. It's like we need to deal, now, do, uh, deal with this now. We have a pandemic. And the rate of digital transformation is really, really quite um, impressive. What we will have to look at is how do we sustain this innovation and transformation? Digitising something doesn't necessarily mean that it's good. So what, what good things can we bring forward um, into our renewal pathways? And importantly, how can we manage COVID, but at the same time, look at delivering this much wider um, care agenda? And when we look at the context of digital transformation, many of you will have heard of this, the, the healthcare one, two, three and four. So healthcare one was where the beginning of digitisation and in a very crude way, that was where we started to look at moving from handwritten notes to entering data um, onto computers. Healthcare two um, was looking at how could we start to integrate these disparate data entries and different um, databases on computers and integrate them together. Healthcare three, where I'd probably see a lot, even a lot of healthcare systems are now, is where we're looking at electronic health records. How do we capture our traditional health data? And with an emerging look at citizen um, generated data, for example, wearables um, data, genomic information, and other health and lifestyle data that we can have within our health, electronic health records. And then healthcare four, so this is actually quite an interesting report from, from Siemens. Um, healthcare four is where digitisation isn't an, an option. It's a core component of what we're doing. It's recognising that we have unprecedented volumes of information now coming from multiple sources, not only traditional health sources, but from sources within a person's life. It's just growing um, each day as we move, move forward. And it's really looking at how can we bring this data together to be much more precise in our care delivery improve patient outcomes, uh, patient outcomes and look at efficiencies, transform delivery to be efficient, optimising, safe and of high quality. Um, and Healthcare 4 talks about capturing vast amounts of data, yes, but importantly, how do we develop actionable insights from it? Um, how can we do something positive with the data and make it happen? Um, so we know there's lots of data out there, but how do we actually make that real world impact? And examples now are like our remote care systems where we're monitoring lots of citizen generated data to generate insights um, leading to actions. Um, and as we can see, citizen generated data is a core component of healthcare 4.0 um, 
moving forward. Just touching on this healthcare 4.0, what sits within that is the Internet of Medical Things. Internet of Things is nothing new, nothing novel, but we can see that this Internet of Medical Things is growing. Medical Things is now um, your wearable data, your shopping data, anything that is related to or I can provide you insights on your health and enable um, insights to generate positive actions to improve outcomes. So this, in, this um, Internet of Medical Things sits firmly within this healthcare 4.0 um, and also um, includes citizen gener generated data in addition to our, our imaging data, um, our, our data from um, blood samples, et cetera, that, that we use within clinical decision making. So what is citizen generated data? And, and this report from the PhD, PhD Foundation is actually a really good report. They have very... Um, lots of very brief but powerful information on citizen generated data and, and moving forward, moving the agenda forward. So I have referred to this quite a lot throughout my talk and they define, you know, when they talk about citizen generated data, they say historically data about our health has been predominantly produced in the healthcare environment. In today's digitised world, however, individuals are now generating increased amounts of health um, related data outside healthcare either intentionally or through the use of um, um, passively through environmental sensors and online activity. Um, and there's this, this growing interest in harnessing this data to inform better healthcare, uh, better predictions and improving clinical decisions. Um, so as I said, it's data produced by citizens for health and wellbeing. Um, and we've seen this real increase in citizen generated data, it's like a data source that's just going to get bigger and bigger as we move forward. For the data scientists um, in the audience, you know, it's a great data set to really be working on because we know there's going to be an abundance of it. It's increasing the ubiquity of smartphones and apps that sit within them and also the sensors that sit within our smartphones and other appending devices. We depend on the internet um, throughout our day. I mean, look at how we're working now with COVID. If we didn't have the internet, you actually think what state would the world um, be in? And there's also been an interest over years, um, an interest in the quantified self. So tracking ourselves through through numbers and quantitatively, and also growing interest in tracking ourselves and comparing ourselves to others. Um, so an example is Strava, the running app. People will track their run, they'll track where they'll be, but they can also see who else is out on them and actually how do they compare to other people um, of their age and gender or, or with other characteristics so this quantified self is looking about ourselves but also how do we compare to other people out there and citizen generated data um, I mean the, the, the impact is, is really quite tremendous so by feeding back data to somebody about themselves about their behavior about their health and lifestyle measurements, we can empower them, we can change their behaviour and we can inform um, decision making. We know that trying to enable people to self-care has been quite challenging. Um, we are trying to do it, it's improving, but have we optimised this whole self-care agenda? I would probably say no. We're also looking at citizen generated data in terms of, I'm not sure crowdsourcing is the right way, but by people holding their own data, their citizen generated data, can we look at how they can share this data for research purposes? Um, and I know that a number of different solutions that I've seen are, are actually looking at that, but that does bring a number of um, legal privacy and other real world um, factors to consider sort of moving forward. I mean, it can definitely personalise healthcare. Just now, um, we talk about person-centred healthcare, but are we truly delivering it? With citizen-generated data, we've got much more understanding about variability at the level of the individual. What are their norms? What is abnormal for them? And we can be much more preemptive um, and targeted um, by doing this. And really what patient generated data along with other data allows us, what I would argue is by having this personal data from an individual to be much more preventative and anticipatory. We've got much more comprehensive data capture from individuals within lots, lots more domains of their lives. Um, and by doing this, we've got a real um, opportunity to start to pick up things as warning things of, 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 of a decline 
and status or a condition emerging as they are happening. We won't have to wait for someone to go to the doctor when, for example, they've got symptoms, which sometimes by that point the disease has manifested. We can start to pick up things in a person's home that they may not naturally pick up themselves. So the, the potential is really quite considerable when we look at the health and care sector. We already have lots of examples of the use of citizen generated data in healthcare. So many of you will have read papers looking at social media, online data forums, looking at disease outbreaks, and looking at diagnosing mental health and declines in mental health. Um, we've seen a growth in, in sensor technologies. There's much more of them. They're much cheaper being used in, in the home environment and wearables to predict declining health. Um, and monitoring activity um, within home care settings. We're seeing within IoT and the Internet of Medical Devices how we're starting to bring citizen generated data with other um, data from other sources and actually bringing this data together gives us huge potential because we're bringing the strengths of all of these different data sets to really advance our understanding um, of disease and importantly wellness as well. Um, and now what we're seeing is um, Hospitals now interested in bringing this citizen generated data into their electronic health records, moving out with the confines of traditional data, imaging data, uh, physiological data, and bringing in, for example, data on wearables, patient reported outcome measures that I will talk about in a bit more depth um, as I move forward. So, examples of, of social media, there are just a, 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 a few papers um, to mention, but for many of you, as you know, it's looking at behavioural or, or linguistic cues from social media to predict the presence of mood and psychological disorders. Um, we have seen in some cases that the use of um, machine learning uh, techniques um, and applying it to social media, we can actually start to predict certain conditions with a relatively high degree um, of accuracy. We have available um, data sets to do this upon. Um, and it's significant potential and additionality in that we've got new data within the healthcare arena. Um, as I said earlier, we can identify precursors earlier in their trajectory. By doing that, we're much more timely and early in our interventions. And what's interesting for me is that we can collect data in a way that is often hard to do and hard to reach populations. So people will, who will often not engage um, with health services as much as they should. It um, allows us to access data from them to generate insights from their perspectives and what they think. So that to me, that's actually a very, very strong component of what we can do with this, this type of citizen generated data. As I mentioned, we've also got sensing technology. So looking at falls, we've got smart homes, um, which is very interesting. The beauty of many sensor technologies um, is that they're unobtrusive, they're continuous and many are real time, which as we know um, for healthcare is, is very, very advantageous. Um, and just going back when I'm talking about people who may have lots of conditions as they get older, they get frailer, um, they can cope less of that burden of multiple diseases. This automated um, collection of real time data, citizen generated data, can in fact reduce burden on the citizen um, as the patient, because there's a paper by Carl May who talks about whilst digital health is important, these digital solutions can maybe add to an existing high burden that people with these multiple chronic diseases have. So by having automated measurement of citizen generated data, we can look at how we can minimise this burden to enable people to self-care and once again improve outcomes. We can see the use of citizen generated data and um, looking at disease outbreaks. So we know that conventional disease surveillance is limited. It's limited to types of data. With social media and with apps, we can now collect citizen generated data and start to pick up trends before they're happening. Um, there's the, the well-known Google flu trends. Um, we've seen lots of this in terms of COVID. And even if we look at the COVID symptom study in the app that people can download, this started on very early. Um, it started to track what symptoms were associated with COVID. From that information, they started to bring new symptoms into COVID-related um, symptoms, such as um, you know GI symptoms for children. So we're trying to we're starting to develop our understanding purely from this citizen-generated data, getting citizens to fill in their data and generate insights. And these are really really good examples 
of why citizen generated data is important and why we have to move forward. An area where, um, in terms of citizen generated data that I've paid quite a lot of focus on has been patient reported outcome measures. Um, and according to the, the FDA, uh, patient reported outcome measures are um, a measurement based on a report that comes directly from the patient. It's what the patient says without amendment or interpretation of the response by a clinician or anyone else. And when we look at studies that look at patient reported outcomes, say on quality of life, and we ask a clinician to rate it and a carer to rate it, we know that the ratings differ from the patient. And to my mind, and a lot of the team that I work with and people I collaborate with, to us, this self-report is gold standard because a patient, a person, as an expert on their cells, um, their condition, their well-being, how they're feeling. So their report is really gold standard. And if collected in the right way, it can really drive in positive systems of care moving forward. So they can capture symptoms. They can capture, um, they're typically administered as a, a questionnaire that people fill in um, to gather the health status of a patient. And um, they can collect information importantly, such as quality of life, physical functioning, performance status, um, outcomes such as anxiety, supportive care needs, self-efficacy, how empowered is someone to care for themselves and if they have a condition. So important self-report that allows us to generate insights about the individual, but also as I'll go on and talk about, about my, my own research, generate um, person-centred actions being driven by this type of citizen-generated data being collected. By collecting citizen-generated data via PROMS, we're actually getting a much more granular picture of the patient experience. So we're not just speaking to people when they come in for hospital appointments, clinical consultations. We can start to collect this information in the person's home on a much more regular basis. So for example, the system that we've developed, we collect data on symptoms associated with um, cancer treatments every day. We're generating a really big data set, understanding how these symptoms um, change for an individual day on day. And we're doing this for a multitude of people. So just think about the data that we're creating and the much more granular picture of that patient experience that we're developing from this citizen data. And in terms of routine care, um, the use of this type of citizen generated data is growing. So there's a lot more hospitals and healthcare systems interested in PROMS, but I'd probably say it's not part of routine care delivery. We do have not have a lot of existing data sets with this current data um, right now, but I think that will improve and in four to five years time, we will have much more of this data at our fingertips to apply um, data science techniques to enhance understanding. But right now, I'd probably say it's a bit of a forgotten par partner when we look at citizen generated data and the big data roadmap, and I'll come back to that um, shortly. So um, the system that we use uh, to collect uh, PROMS, the citizen generated data, is called the Advanced Symptom Management System. It sits firmly within healthcare three and four. Um, and from our system, as I said, people get a mobile phone and app, and we can collect their patient reported outcome measures along with physiological measurements a much um, higher frequency and importantly at the home care setting when people are going about their day-to-day -day lives. And what we have shown is that using PROMS within digital systems, the citizen generated data can really drive new models of much more proactive care that, that, that instigates um, early intervention. And really um, these systems, as I said, they generate multiple data points of PROMS over time. We can collect it during treatment, we can collect it after treatment. In terms of treatments like chemotherapy and cancer therapies, often the trials will only collect data um, during treatment and maybe for a short period after. But if we can collect this data as standard over time, we get much better insights, not only into the immediate impacts of medicines, for example, but also the longer term impacts, which is important to know. Um, in terms of our system, we've built it from early development and we've just finished a large European trial last year. We recruited over 800 patients across five European countries. And from this study, we have 10, over 10,000 data points of patient reported outcome measures. And this is where we're really starting to look at how can we advance the citizen generated data agenda in cancer care by applying, for example, machine learning techniques to this data that we've collected using these systems. 
just a brief um, diagram showing how our system works and how citizen generated data really can result in very much a system that pushes um, response based on patients' own reported needs. So for example, as I say, people can fill in, for example, side effects of chemotherapy on a mobile phone daily. Then with um, evidence-based clinical risk algorithms, based on that citizen generated report, we can trigger alerts um, to healthcare professionals at the hospital um, if there's quick intervention required. But importantly, from the citizen generated data, we can make sure that we feed back evidence-based self-care, promoting people to enable to care for themselves um, and empowering um, that, that self-motivation um, in terms of their disease management. Um, and really using this citizen generated data, we have demonstrated a much more proactive symptom management system, as opposed to what happened before that was that patients went home, um, they would phone up the hospital if they had problems, but often they would go back three weeks later and a one-off snapshot report how they felt to that professional. So you can see how the systems collect more information, but importantly, how this citizen generated data can drive a much more proactive, real-time and responsive model of care. Our trial is now finished. Actually, yesterday I was finishing our main results paper for the British Medical Journal. But really, basically, our results showed um, really overwhelmingly positive improvements in patient outcomes from symptom burden to quality of life um, to self-efficacy. You know, from our system, um, our, our results are indicating that people were more empowered to care for themselves. And this is from this very much citizen oriented uh, digital system. So another very interesting part of eSmart um, was how can we start putting patient reported outcomes on the big data roadmap? So how can we use this citizen generated data looking at in the backdrop of healthcare three and four and develop more predictions and more targeted therapies from this data from citizens? Um, and this is uh, work that we did as work package five um, of, 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 of eSmart. And this work was led by our colleagues in UCSF and the University of Surrey. However, um, I was PI of eSmart and, and obviously the collabs have, did, did have some involvement in, in progressing this work as well. So as I say, this was us looking at predictive risk models using PROMS data. It was about applying machine learning to generate predictions of chemotherapy toxicity at a group and an individual level. So could we identify groups who were at low risk of of um, toxicity at medium risk, and importantly, those at high risk, so we could actually target them accordingly. But also looking at developing predictions at the level of the individual. So for someone going in with breast cancer, a certain age receiving certain treatments with certain other conditions, could we, for example, start to develop these maps where someone would know at the start the likelihood of a symptom occurring at their individual level then allowing professionals to be much more targeted, target that specific symptom that we know, for example, someone has over a 70% um, likelihood of experiencing. So it's becoming much more proactive, preventative, targeted, as opposed to just now, where people go in to get their chemotherapy treatment, they might be told about 15 to 20 symptoms that can experience, um, and then they have to go through that experience and see whether what symptoms will manifest and what ones will become more troublesome for them. And really the work we did was really novel within the field of cancer symptom management. So led by colleagues in Surrey, and as I say in UCSF, we published some great articles in Nature Scientific Reports and, and Plus One. Um, this is the one um, in Nature Scientific um, Reports, and this was where um, we looked at uh, the network analysis. It was 1,300 patients, so not a bad um, data set. We, do, we used machine learning models um, and we looked at developing neural networks, looking at three dimensions of the symptom experience from incidence, severity, and also distress. Um, and from this, we developed, we identified different networks based on whether the dimension of the symptom experience that we were looking at. And this was one of the first studies to start to look at the differences in, in networks and associations when you look at different dimensions. What was interesting from the work led by our colleagues in Surrey and UCSF was that nausea appeared to be a, 
are starkly important nodes in all three networks. So for a clinician, that means that actually, if you were to target nausea as part of that network, it'd be interesting to know how would the network change if you actually proactively manage that symptom. And really what this work started to do using this citizen generated data, using machine learning and, and AI techniques, starting to derive insights that we never had before, which can really advance clinical practice um, moving forward and, and, and are really quite exciting. But also part of eSmart, what we were interested in, yes, we have this citizen generated data is great. Yes, we can apply, apply data science, machine learning techniques. But what does it mean in the real world? So whilst, as you can see, these networks that were developed are still very academic um, within their development. But importantly, what we wanted to know was how do people in the real world respond to this? Will they ever use it? Would they find it useful? Is this data important? Is it not? And I'd probably say that in lots of studies, um, we, are, we are advancing the data science agenda when it comes to system generated data, but it's just as important to look at these human factors. If we ignore these human factors, we might advance data science, but will it ever be used in the real world? So what we did was we ran patient and professional focus groups and interviews across the five European countries that we conducted eSmart. We recruited over 50 participants. We presented them the predictive risk models. We asked them about what did they think of them, how would they use them, and would they find it helpful? Enlightening us on advancing this citizen generated agenda, but also what things do we need to look at? What things do we need to overcome when we're trying to progress it in the real world? So this is just um, some snapshots of the findings that we have. So when we speak, we spoke to patients and we showed them these models that could predict their symptoms. A lot of people were positive. They said, you know, it's good to know in advance. It's good to have a guiding light. It could reduce anxiety because you kind of know what you're going to get. And for people, it's been able to inform themselves. So actually having more information um, can make reassure people and make them feel better. They also spoke about how this insight could allow them to plan and, and prepare. So this person in the first quote here is talking about how they were trying to work whilst they were getting their treatment. So by knowing what to expect and when, they could plan accordingly. And other people speaking about how it could prepare them mentally. Um, and then people being more aware of self-care. So if you know what symptoms you're likely to experience at the level of you as a person, you can start to prepare yourself in understanding what can you do yourselves to self-care. So moving on this self-care agenda and people who like to be prepared and organised, you know, if I get a symptom, I'm already in a, a very proactive position and know exactly what to do. So you can see the real positives of these predictions and informing and optimising the patient experience. For a lot of people with cancer and other conditions, it's important to know What's normal for that disease? Is this normal? Often if people know it's normal or expected, they'll have less anxiety related to that. And even now with COVID, um, many people will be saying when they get a sniffle or respiratory symptoms, is COVID or is this the common flu or cold? Um, so having some indication of what's normal, or what's expected for this treatment can help people. Interesting, they said, by having these predictions and insights, um, they could educate people that were living with them and actually um, bringing them in as part of their care circle. If they know what to expect um, and they can see it visually, seeing is believing, it actually might enhance that support that the individual would get within the home setting, but also in terms of family playing a role and being able to do something. And importantly, you know, giving people a sense of control. So when we look at self-care and we look at things like locus of control, that self-control is very important. And the, the last quote here, I think knowledge is power, is actually very insightful. So if people do have more information, they can have more control over their illness. However, they did have negative mindsets. Um, people, some people just didn't want, um, they didn't want to know what was going to happen beforehand. They didn't want the crystal ball. It would have made them feel very negative, um, which is obviously something that has to be consider considered. Um, and that people say they'd worry more. So it's almost like if you knew what was going to happen, you would worry more. So we really need to think about this. In my mind, it's about not just presenting the information, it's presenting it in a positive way so that people understand the predictions from their data, but importantly, also understand that by having these predictions, we can look to reverse and mitigate them 
So there is that patient education component moving forward. Some people spoke of a self-fulfilling prophecy that if you're told you're going to get the symptoms, you're going to get them. Um, so something else to think about because we know that this is something that does happen um, and can manifest. And some people are very, were very sceptical. Um, you know, how can it really do that? You know, saying how can this machine learning and citizen generated data um, really predict? Um, you know, people saying it's like science fiction. Can we really do this? So the sceptics, there is something about how do we change the sceptics or how do we inform the sceptics to not be as sceptical and be more engaging of the, the AI and citizen generated agenda and, and, and embracing healthcare 4.0. Professionals could see a multitude of benefits. They recognise they could um, see problems earlier, intervene earlier, and stop these inappropriate admissions to AE and to hospital, which we know does happen. Um, you can actually mitigate and reduce and stop certain um, symptoms from occurring um, and actually enable therapies to much more targeted and act quicker if you know what's happening. Um, and also they spoke about how they have very limited time with patients. So by having these predictions um, of the likely symptoms, it could be much more targeted in their face-to-face their -face or their virtual communications as we have now, um, and trying to ensure that the person understands the information accordingly. And also by being more targeted. So within healthcare, sometimes you might have to go through the different levels of um, intervention before you get to the right intervention. But if you have this information and you can be targeted and deliver the right intervention first time, it improves outcomes, but it'll also reduce costs. Um, sorry, just... sorry, I've just been playing one minute. Yeah. Health professional barriers like patients, and um, they were sceptical of it. There was almost like a notion that they didn't fully really understand what these uh, machine learning could do and how it can be holistic and that you can bring lots of different types of data in, in, in progressing such information. Um, a lot of them felt that actually what was the additionality of these models? We already work preventively, preventatively. We already make these predictions and act on them. Um, Fair enough, respect their, their, their perceptions of this, but when we do, do look at overall healthcare delivery, we do know that we are not preventative enough and we're not acting early enough. So in my mind, there is something about education here, about the additionality, and also we need to look at evidence to convince health professionals that this way forward, using system-generated data is the way to go. And then just finishing off, so I, I talked about this earlier, but the, the PhD PhD Foundation, um, they've, they've, they've said there's certain questions that we need to ask about citizen health data and how do we progress it, so things to add to the agenda. So health system impact, we've got changing dynamics of how health data is generated. We're creating an ecosystem where we're holding more, more data, different types of data. How do our health systems adapt? How do we impact the citizen interactions with and expectations of the health system? If we have much more of this citizen data, how does it impact on this? Data utility. So we know there's lots of different types of system generated data, but what data is particularly useful? You know, we actually have to start to hone down into what types of data really, really are helpful. And if so, what data sets are of sufficient quality to inform the applications? We know with AI, with machine learning, garbage in, garbage out. So there's something about ensuring that the data that we use is of high quality. Um, and if we collect it for healthcare, so for example, if we start to collect this as part of our electronic health record or routine healthcare, um, who will it be collated by? Um, who should manage these data sets? Who will analyse them and who will interpret them? Do we have a resource within the NHS to do this or not? Or, or what will that look like? We've got the same old problem of data integration um, with disparate uh, sources of data. Um, and how can we achieve that with a, with a healthcare system that's already looking at widespread digitisation? How do we cope with all the data? Is there implications for safety? So lots of very important questions that um, with, as, as clinicians and as data scientists and health services researchers and other groups we need to think about. Data, data and device regulation, what are the impacts in GDPR? 
on medical device regulations um, and privacy protections. So how, how is this data going to be managed? Could it breach privacy, violate human rights? What are the safeguards that we need and protection that we need, particularly for vulnerable groups? Um, so lots of questions that as we advance this agenda, we need to think about. And a bit that I'm really interested in, as you can see, is this user acceptability and user appetite. What is it, the user acceptability for system generated data um, and its use within healthcare or research? And also, how do we manage um, rights over use? Uh, you know, will the, the data, is the data held at the, the level of the individual? Um, if it's in the public domain, do people still want rights over it? Um, and what is a long term appetite for the use of this type of data and the digital solutions that generate it? Um, and I think this is very pertinent when we look at digital solutions. We know that often people will use them for a small period of time, but sustainability and collection and use of data is still a problem. So we need to design systems that people are happy to use or that are not burdensome and where people will enable us to collect this important type of data over time to generate insights. So just finishing off, citizen generated data, there's huge potential. It's going to grow, it, it's in abundance. I'm really need to think about how do we use it more within our healthcare agendas. But as um, the PhD Foundation have said, the fundamental question is whether and how in practice we can use it to under, advance our understanding of health and disease, support better healthcare and improve citizen health. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roma, for a fantastic talk. Uh, you touch upon so many uh, data science, current theme data science uh, research that's going on, personalization, uh, proactive information systems, explainability, and so on. Uh, it just shows that there's uh, so much work a data science community can do in healthcare and digital health and, and so on. So we have time for one quick question from the audience. Um, uh, okay, I'll, I'll just ask a question. Uh, so through your presentation, you mentioned several interesting projects. One of them is eSmart. Uh, one of the things uh, as a data science community that we love is data. Uh, I was wondering, you have collected any data or can any of this data has been shared? Would you like to explain some of that aspects? Yes, so we're, we're currently now looking at um, data curation and you know, part of the agreement with the EU that we will make this data um, accessible for secondary data analysis, but obviously we need to look at how we manage it, um, how we ensure uh, quality projects are conducted um, with the data and um, so we're in the, in, at the point of doing that uh, just now but part of the challenge with these large trials and what I'm gathering is you get lots of resource to do the trial and to collect the data but when it comes to the management of the data post trial um, there are resource implications that become make things challenging so I think it is something that we do need to look at and there needs to be more resource and financial assistance to make sure that when we have, so for example, the eSmart data set, it's like gold dust just now, you know, it's got daily symptom data over time from hundreds of people with cancer across several countries. Um, so in order to really make sure that that data is exploited in the right way, and optimally, we need to look at, um, there needs to be resources available to enable that from funders to look at the bigger picture um, of the data science continuum. So whilst we will do it, we're hoping that I see within the next six months, at least we will have some guidance on that. It, there are challenges that, that we're encountering that we probably didn't think of at the start. Absolutely. That's probably the best way to do um, I see uh, Mike Chandler uh, would like to ask a question. We, a, a very short one, Mike, please go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joshua. I was just wondering what um, you found uh, was the mixture between kind of unstructured text, the usefulness of that in self-reports, and more quantitative or categorical data. Um, uh, and what was your experience in your projects between the mix of those two and what was most valuable and easy to handle? 
Yeah, um, Mike, so, so in our projects, we did, um, we used the structured responses from PROM, so we, we didn't use the, the free text data. Um, and most of our PROMs actually didn't have that free text um, option. Uh, but moving forward and actually working with people like Yashar, we're now actually starting to look more um, at the use of, of, of free text within healthcare. Um, and looking at you know machine learning, natural language processing, to generate additional insights to bring to our more objective prom data. So we didn't do it in eSmart, but we are we are looking at it now. Great. Let's let's thanks uh, Roma again for her fantastic talk. Uh, very interesting. Uh, so um, uh, thanks Roma. Very much appreciate it. Uh, so. It's my pleasure now to introduce the second keynote speaker of the session, Professor Nick Bailey. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with Nick when I was at UBDC uh, as a data scientist, and we continue our collaboration since the, now. Uh, so Nick is a professor of urban uh, studies at the University of Glasgow. He has long-standing interest in the analysis of social welfare in urban areas and how the geography of welfare is changing. His work examines urban planning in a broad sense, encompassing areas including housing and social policy. He is director of ESRC funded Urban Big Data Center and associate director of Scottish Center of Administrative Data Research, also ESRC funded. Both centers are involved in pioneering the use of novel forms of data and analytics approaches for policy relevant urban research. So Nick is gonna give us a talk on doing data science for sustainable societies. Within his talk, he's going to present, his talks will focus on the work of the Urban Big Data Center at the University of Glasgow. Established in 2014, the UBDC is a multidisciplinary collaboration of social scientists and data scientists. It is both a research center and part of the UK's national data infrastructure. From their efforts over the last six years, they have amazed a wide experience in challenges of delivering research and analysis to support policies and sustainable societies. So in his presentation, he will reflect on the experience and in particular, and many challenges in doing effective, impactful urban data centers. Data science. Uh, Nick, all yours. Thank you very much, Yasha. And I'll just start the uh, screen sharing. So I hope is that the right the right view, Yasha? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the uh, invitation to come and talk to this group today. It's a uh, it's a pleasure. We have some uh, con connections with Sixer. Uh, through Glasgow and Strathclyde colleagues and others, um, and it's great to kind of uh, be part of your event. Uh, like Roma, I'm going to start off with a disclaimer that I'm not a data scientist, uh, but as Yasha said in the introduction, I, I spent the last six years working very closely with data scientists in a multidisciplinary uh, centre uh, where we work with a number of social scientists interested in, uh, in cities and urban areas. Um, and I want to describe some of the work of the centre and reflect on the challenges we've faced in, in trying to do data science for sustainable societies. Um, so it's not a talk about uh, techniques particularly, um, although I'll touch on different data sources and uh, briefly on some of the techniques and methodologies, but more about the kind of context for our work, the processes involved and the practicalities uh, of it. So as Starting point then is this, uh, it is hopefully captured by this, uh, this graphic that uh, on the one hand, um, we're interested in the, the challenges and opportunities uh, facing urban areas. You know, you, 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 we all uh, um, look at or are unaware of the you know, enormous transformation that cities, particularly in developed countries, uh, have seen in the last 50 or 60 years. The economic base of these cities has been completely remade. Uh, the manufacturing industries of the past around which they grew up have vanished and driven by technology. They're now the homes largely of, of service-based industries. Um, 
that's uh, that's been a huge economic and social challenge, but also an opportunity because cities find themselves well placed uh, to be the the hubs of these of many of these new service and knowledge based industries. And environment, environmentally, cities are places of challenges because they are the great kind of centers of pollution uh, production and greenhouse gas emissions. But at the same time, they're an opportunity uh, because the kind of density, uh, which is a, the key characteristic of cities, um, gives opportunities for more sustainable ways of living based around public transport, uh, high density neighborhoods, walking cities and the like. So cities are really at the heart of the uh, UN's uh, sustainability agenda. To ask the urban context, on the other hand, on the other side, I don't really need to tell this audience, I don't think about the digital revolution, uh, the ways in which we uh, produce ever increasing volumes of data in our daily lives, and the new tools which data scientists have developed for turning that data into knowledge. That's the, that's the pros and the opportunity in, in the digital, digital revolution. But then again, we have also the, the cons and potential disadvantages. And I think Rome has touched on some of these already. Uh, these technologies may themselves be neutral, but their applications are not. Technology can be used to inform citizens, consult citizens, empower citizens, or to monitor control and even oppress citizens. Technologies can reproduce and entrench existing inequalities when we train our AI models uh, on a biased data set. And we have all too often inequalities in our access to data um, so that the uh, greater control of that data lies in the hands of large companies rather than within the reach of citizens or academics or public policy makers. So that's really the, the context in which we set up the Urban Big Data Centre. Uh, we set it up in order to try to bring these data and these new techniques uh, within the kind of um, into partnership with social sciences to do something around promotion of uh, economic, social, environmental well-being in cities, promoting the use of big data and these new data science based technologies. To do that, the, the, the center requires a kind of technical base. We have a certain amount of IT infrastructure and we've acquired over time uh, in various ways I'll go on to describe a whole range of data assets which can be brought uh, into our work. And we can do that because we have a, a really strong uh, expert data science capability within the center. But that's married then with a, um, a two other capabilities that I think are important. One obvious one, which is our domain expertise. We have a group of co-eyes who come from various fields of urban studies, um, interested in different aspects of, of, uh, of urban change and development. Uh, bringing kind of questions and, and focus to the work uh, of, the, uh, of our technical colleagues. Uh, and alongside that, an expertise which is perhaps less obvious, but which is around data governance, around the, the law and the ethics and the, and the, um, the practical issues around managing data and uh, manage, you know, making sure we use data in ways which are legal and ethical. Um, so, as Yasha said, we are both a research centre pursuing a, an academic agenda, but also funded to be part of the, of the UK's national data infrastructure. So we have a role in curating and creating data sets which other researchers can then apply to use, and in supporting the, the building of uh, uh, research capacity for social uh, data science, or data science applied to the challenges of, of sustainable societies. We are of, of moderate, moderate size, around uh, 20 staff and around 10 academic co-eyes, and the staff spread uh, across the data science team, the research team, ad, and admin and comms. And we focus on these five main uh, themes at the moment. In terms of our objectives, uh, we are interested in doing uh, high quality scientific research and publishing the way that academics do. But we also always emphasize engagement with policy uh, and a continual dialogue with policymakers and practitioners who are responsible for planning and policy making in our cities at local and national level. And then alongside that, we want to enhance the quality and methods and availability of data. And we want to 
try to understand and influence policies around the use of data at a higher level. So how can we support government to realize the value of data and to put in place uh, a framework, a legal and policy framework, which supports greater use of data in practice? And lastly, we have a role as a center of excellence for teaching and capacity building. We have a PhD program, we have our own MSc in urban analytics and a, a range of other teaching contributions. A word about uh, big data, I think. I mean, I think um, we, we're called the Urban Big Data Center. Uh, I often find the term uh, unhelpful in our context, our context, because most of the data sets we use are not really, the, the, the challenge with them is not really the size. They're not especially large. Some are of reasonable size, but by and large, they don't meet the kind of physicists or data scientists definition of big uh, data. Uh, new forms of data might be a, a, better, a better label these days, uh, or naturally occurring data. Uh, the contrast for us is that they are not like the traditional forms of data which we as social scientists are used to using. So for us, as quantitative social researchers, we would tend to use data sets which come out, curate, out of curated social research processes, the census gathering, the household surveys, where we know the way that, uh, the data have been generated. We've got a good handle on, uh, on its biases and its, and its quality and so on. Big data, new forms of data emerge out of all these different systems, uh, systems which are sensor-based, um, the whole range of sensors in our urban environment from traffic sensors and CCTV to environmental quality sensors and so on, remote sensing, and of course, mobile phones. They emerge out of business systems. Uh, where we make transactions online or where, we, where businesses advertise services uh, uh, online. They emerge out of, our, out of our public administrative systems. Again, Roma's talked about the kind of records we have from uh, health uh, administration systems, but there are tax and benefit systems, education, crime, and, and many others. And lastly, there are again, the, you know, the user-generated contact content, which again, Roma uh, focused on a lot, social media and the, uh, the data we generate through apps. And in many cases, you know, the, the ways in which these data are generated are unique to these systems and carry quirks and biases and limitations particular to these systems. What are the advantages for us as, 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 social, uh, as, as you know, social scientists interested in cities? Um, well, the obvious uh, points really, you know, the scale of these data sets um, allows us uh, you know, to cover multiple cities uh, and allows us to drill down within those cities to particular local uh, areas, small areas and neighborhoods and to subgroups within them. Uh, so the scale and coverage of these data sets is a great asset compared to your typical household survey where you're, you're lucky if you can get down to a kind of local authority wide picture. The flow of these data uh, and their kind of timeliness can be a real asset with a household survey, particularly national, national government household surveys, you're waiting at least uh, a year before you can get your hands on data, rather than having data flowing on a kind of you know, minute by minute or daily basis. Uh, and for many of the kind of urban applications that I'm interested in, it isn't so much the availability of real time data. Uh, you know, I don't need to know what's happening uh, on a minute by minute basis in my city. Um, but I'm certainly interested in the current climate, in, in what's happening, what's happened in the last month and the last week and even the last day. So these kind of near real time data, which comes from the, the, many of these uh, systems, is a, is a, you know, a huge uh, improvement over traditional social statistics. The fact that many of these systems give us longitudinal data so we can track individuals over time and also historical data, we can go back and look at past events, we can look at their prior health records, their prior employment records, um, and understand current situations in that much more detail. We've got the opportunity to join and integrate data from different systems and look at the interaction of different uh, domains or different public services, for example. Uh, a lot of my work around uh, social and housing policy is interested in the ways in which when government makes a change in this area, what is, what's the impact on this area over here? So when government tries to uh, reduce expenditure on welfare benefits, uh, introduce um, punitive sanctions for people who they feel are not looking hard enough to find a job when they're unemployed. Does that have unintended adverse consequences on their health? Does that create 
an extra burden on the health system. And lastly, it lets us fill gaps in the, in the, in the world of social statistics, and particularly in lots of areas in, in the kind of the digital world. So much of our economy moves, the platform economy you know, is moving economic activity online. Really, online systems and big data are the only ways to, to study this in any kind of detail. So these are the advantages. So alongside that come a whole range of challenges. Uh, some of these challenges are, are technical, the challenges which our data science uh, teams uh, address around capturing and managing, wrangling data into a, a useful form, extracting uh, information from the less structured parts of it. But there are many other challenges we face in, in doing uh, social data science, uh, which are partly around the, the, the legal and uh, uh, financial barriers to accessing data. Who owns the data? Who has rights to access it? How do we negotiate rights as researchers to access these data? What are the costs uh, of doing that? And then there are ethical challenges as well. Um, and here we, we, we tend to kind of think quite a lot about the ethics of, of, of privacy. Um, how do we you know, ensure that we can, uh, you know, we don't uh, intrude into user privacy or individual privacy, that we protect it when we access data and join data from multiple systems? And that's fine, and we should be, should be content with that. We, we, we should be content to work within the law on, on privacy, absolutely. Although when you look at the way that uh, many users behave online, privacy does not seem uh, to be a large feature of their, uh, you know, their, 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 the ways in which they share data or agree to kind of the use and reuse of their data. For me, the, the really interesting and important ethical issue, uh, if we're going to use these data to inform public policy is around their validity, around whether they represent the phenomenon we're really interested in representing. Uh, whether they do it in a way which is unbiased and representative of the population at large. I'll come back perhaps and talk a little bit about that and some of the examples. And then when it comes to, uh, once we've accessed the data, when it comes around to the actual analytical challenges, again, we've got the technical challenges of, of, uh, of um, extracting useful information and intelligence from the data from representing that, visualizing it and so on, which data scientists and, and quantitative social researchers are, are well equipped to do. Uh, but we have to come back to these issues around documenting and demonstrating the validity and the, uh, the quality of the data that we're using. So let's perhaps kind of get, make this a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, less abstract. I'll get, talk through with some of the examples of, of, of work that we've been involved in at UBDC in the last uh, five or so years and hopefully illustrate some of the different kinds of data we work with and some of the different challenges that they, uh, they bring for us. So the first one's a very uh, relatively simple example. Um, we're interested in how, uh, the extent to which people in different parts of the city have uh, access to public transport in order to move around uh, if they don't happen to own a car uh, in order to access employment or access other services, uh, leisure activities and so on. So which parts of our cities have better and worse access to public transport? Well, in the past, we can do this through household surveys, but they give us very limited geographic information. They're very slow and unresponsive to changes in, in, in transport system. So what we can do is we can scrape data uh, which the public transport providers themselves lodge with a national database through an open API. The data is open, anyone can in theory go and use it, but actually it's very, uh, quite messy data, quite challenging to convert from the form in which public trans transit providers lodge it into a form which actually tells you about the relative quality of transport services in different areas. So there's a kind of technical challenge, a data science challenge in uh, scraping this data, harvesting this data uh, and converting it into a range of accessibility indices. But there are no kind of privacy issues or financial issues or legal issues. Is it open data licensed for uh, open uh, use? And we can produce this kind of map then for, which is for uh, Glasgow uh, of the um, relative uh, accessibility to the city center, in this case, uh, from different neighborhoods of the city. And we can look at the way in which that changes as bus companies come and go and services are axed. And we can use it to then relate to accessibility to different opportunities like employment opportunities and whether this has then a bearing on, on employment rates 
in different areas. And that in turn then forms part of the dialogue we can have with local authorities around interventions they can make using powers they have under transport legislation. A slightly different example uh, comes from our, another project, which is beginning to look at the, um, uh, looking at the impact of the sharing economy, the platform economy uh, on the housing and tourism sector or Airbnb to give it its a more widely understood name. Uh, this is a, a sector which has exploded and come from nowhere in the last uh, five or 10 years uh, to the point where we now have in, in places like Edinburgh more than 10,000 properties actively being marketed uh, in a city uh, with a population of I think 400,000 last time I looked. So it's a, you know, suddenly a, a substantial activity uh, changing the use of the existing housing stock. What is this doing to the housing supply and the neighborhoods uh, in the places most heavily affected? And it's been, a, it's been an issue which has been widely debated in, in Parliament, uh, Westminster and, and Scotland and many other countries around the world. Uh, governments are thinking, well, how do we, you know, what should, when do we begin to regulate this sector? How do we regulate this sector? Now, Airbnb is a company which has uh, not, not necessarily been very keen on uh, scrutiny, I think. Um, it doesn't make its listings publicly available. It's been reluctant to provide uh, data to urban authorities who want to understand what's going on. There are companies where you can buy data who, who have presumably done some licensing deal uh, with Airbnb, but they're very expensive. And of course, the data is Airbnb's copyright. Um, however, there are exemptions within copyright law which allow us to scrape uh, and analyze the data for non-commercial uh, research. And so we've been using these exemptions to and applying various scraping technologies to build a database uh, of Airbnb listings across the UK. Uh, and from this, we can then derive estimates of useful indicators like occupancy rates of the property. We can look at calendars that Airbnb hosts have of property availability and not wholly accurately, but we can estimate uh, occupancy rates. From that, you can work out the rough rental income for different properties in different places. And from that, you can work out the relative income they, an owner can generate from putting a property on Airbnb for short-term rental versus selling it on the open market for an owner-occupier or renting it long-term in the traditional rental market. And so you can work out which neighborhoods look most vulnerable to the, uh, the march of Airbnb. Where does Airbnb look most profitable uh, for uh, potential investors? So not just where is Airbnb now, but where is it likely to spread in the future? And that can then inform the, the policy debates around the future regulation of the sector. And we've worked very closely uh, with colleagues in Scottish Parliament on, on some of this work. It's also been, and this is what the, uh, the, the, the graphic shows on the, on the right hand side, it's also been a, a source of useful uh, insight uh, into some of the changes in the urban areas that have resulted from the pandemic and the resulting lockdown. So here you see the red, this is Edinburgh and Glasgow. Apologies, the, the text is rather small. Uh, this is, uh, and, and red line is uh, obviously this year, 2020, and the blue line, the kind of the uh, uh, bookings levels in, in 2019. And you can see how the uh, bookings flatlined uh, after lockdown and Airbnb were, after a little uh, bit, uh, uh, um, encouraged to close bookings. Um, later graphics, we, we are beginning to kind of see it, the market reopen again after the uh, listings went back live in July. It gives us an insight on a daily basis uh, to the, this, this particular aspect of urban functioning. So the, this is the kind of near real-time indicators, which I think are particularly useful to policymakers at this time. So it's a kind of a long-term game about regulation, a long-term debate about regulation, and a short-term use of these data in terms of the uh, uh, it, managing lockdown and its consequences. Uh, another example is uh, again touching on a subject which is of great interest to policymakers, which is what we call active travel, encouraging people to move around the city in ways which are good for their health through walking and cycling rather than getting into a car uh, and producing pollution. Um, and it's using, uh, this is, you know, again, a, a topic which is hard to capture through traditional means. 
Household surveys give a very thin coverage because relatively few people at the moment in the UK at least cycle on a regu regular basis. So you get a very small sample. You can do on-street surveys and cordon counts and so on using various kinds of manual or automated technologies, but they're relatively poor coverage uh, and limited uh, in, in kind of temporal detail. Um, so we've uh, worked with, in this case, Strava, uh, a well-known uh, uh, fitness uh, tracking uh, company app. Uh, and we're using, we have a license with them to make available uh, the, uh, you know, the user volunteer data from this, uh, this app. There are some interesting um, uh, issues here. So the, the, the cost of the license fee uh, and that uh, it is a kind of a, although we have some resources for data acquisition, there's a limit to how much data we can acquire. Um, and that creates therefore, you know, some inequalities in access. We can't offer our users free access to data for, for as much of the country as we might want to. There are technical issues here as well. Strava process the data in order to uh, reassure their users about privacy, and that's entirely reasonable. But there are debates about the algorithm that they have used to process that data. And in particular, they changed it recently because they became a little more concerned about user privacy. We think they changed it in a way which is unhelpful for data quality, um, but they're a private company. It's their choice how they process that data. For, you, for us as users, we get some general uh, information on how it's processed. We don't really get to see all the details behind it. And yet it has a substantial impact on data quality. Then there's the issue about validation. So one of the first things for us is to see what, what, um, what kind of ground truth sources are available, available to us to understand the quality of, of the data and how well it represents uh, cycling activities in our city. Now we know Strava users are not like cyclists as a whole. We know they tend to be younger on average. Uh, they tend to be more likely to be male. Uh, they're more likely to cycle longer distances uh, and to cycle faster. And we know this from various uh, validation surveys uh, and comparison with household surveys. So they're not representative, but the question for us in terms of using the data for urban planning is whether their patterns of cycling within the city might still be uh, broadly representative of wider patterns of cycling. Uh, even though they're a, a non-representative group? And the answer to that does seem to be by and large, yes. And we can, we can get this uh, at least a partial answer by comparing, um, by looking at the kind of data we have from cordon counts. These are, these are counts which, uh, manual counts which local authorities conduct in certain cities at a number of places on a couple of days in the year. And we can look at whether the variation between these manual counts over time and across space are matched by the similar variations in our Strava data. And uh, we're reasonably happy with the, the representativeness of the Strava data. So we can then use this data to do uh, before and after evaluations of the impacts, for example, of investment in cycling infrastructure. How well does cycling infrastructure get used? To what extent does it contribute to an increase in cycling? And does it take uh, um, cyclists off adjacent um, you know, pu public roads, um, you know, reducing uh, congestion or reducing the kind of conflict between other, with other road users on those spaces. So we can, we can give government feedback then for the first time, I think, in detail on the kind of um, wider value of investment in cycling infrastructure, and perhaps even its, its kind of health payoff eventually as well. And again, in the current context, the pandemic, as, as the chart below, shows we can provide a relative picture uh, of cycling levels in different cities and how they've changed uh, under, the, um, under the kind of lockdown conditions. And here where this is data for the current year relative to previous years in each of these cities, the black line is commuting traffic and the, uh, the kind of cream line, brown line is, is leisure traffic. And we see that um, even before lockdown, uh, there has been a drop off in commuting traffic, uh, but a big increase in leisure traffic. So we might begin to see later on uh, the commuting traffic picking up and that being an indication of uh, the recovery of people going back to workplaces. Third example, and this is uh, you know, closer to my uh, particular interest as a kind of housing researcher, is we can use the data to study one of the um, major changes in the housing system which has occurred 
uh, over the last 25 years, which is the, the growth in long-term uh, private rental accommodation. Uh, in the UK, this was a very small part of the housing system 25 years ago. Uh, relatively few people lived in private renting and most of them for a relatively short period of time. But in the last 25 years, uh, we've seen the proportion increase enormously and particularly increase amongst lower income households as well. And it's becoming a, a long-term housing solution. Uh, although many people think it's not a particularly suitable solution uh, because the problems of uh, higher levels of sub substandard property, uh, poor management uh, and weak uh, tenant uh, rights and tenant protection. It's quite hard to study the, the sector at a small area level uh, using traditional forms of data. Um, and so what we've done at UBDC is to take out a license with a paid license again with one of the major commercial firms here uh, Zoopla, uh, who have this uh, uh, fantastic kind of um, website for, with, with, where people list or they relist uh, properties available for rent. Um, again, there are issues around the there are, you know, technical data management issues, which are quite hidden. Um, when we extract data from the API, uh, the data have a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of it incomplete fields, a lot of messiness, a lot of uh, decisions to be made uh, in order to reach the final research data set. Decisions which, which are largely, again, would largely be hidden when you see kind of commercial products in this area. There are lots of companies who will sell you indicators of rents uh, in cities derived from this data, uh, but you don't get to see what they've included and what they've left out. So we can begin to see much in much finer detail how these choices affect our understanding of rental markets uh, in cities. Uh, conduct, you know, we can conduct a number of sensitivity analyses uh, to look at which the cr crucial decisions are. We can uh, do validation of these data against uh, other sources. The figure on the bottom left is a fairly crude evaluation against the, uh, the last census, which is now rather dated. There are other validations against um, government collected data we've done as well. But we think the, the, the data, the properties advertised by Zoopla represent pretty well the market as a whole. And then we can use that, and this is the kind of figure on the top right hand side, to look in, uh, in, in great detail at how the rental markets in cities uh, are changing over time. And without going into detail, what you're seeing here is a kind of schematic uh, picture of four UK cities looking at the uh, median rents uh, for properties, working out, working from city center out towards the suburban edge. And you see what urban land theory suggests you should see, you see a, a kind of rent gradient. It's more expensive in the, in the city center than it is further out. We always knew that. But we can see in, in a lot of detail how that's shifting over time. Uh, is the gradient steepening? And is that perhaps what lies behind some of the social changes we're seeing in cities where lower income groups are being driven out of uh, residences in the inner city center, the gentrification of our, our cities. And all this analysis then can feed into uh, discussions with, again, Scottish Parliament in this case, around uh, their efforts to regulate the sector uh, and improve uh, rights for tenants. And we can understand um, because we have a historic picture of the sector uh, in Scotland going back a number of years, and we have the data for Scotland and for England where the law hasn't changed, we can then have a very uh, powerful an analysis of the impacts of regulatory changes on the supply uh, and the price of properties uh, in the Scottish rental market. And we can feed that back then to, to policy makers. Last example um, uh, will be a piece of work which is a more recent development for us where we're interested in uh, developing tools to let us look at how people use public space in the city. So there have been lots of efforts uh, to revitalize city center areas, to keep them as vibrant places, even as the high street changes under all the kind of changes in our shopping behaviors, we move online, we're all aware of the kind of declining presence of, of, of shops in city centers and the shift from retail to more leisure activities and kind of general sense that, that, that many high street shopping locations are really quite vulnerable and fragile at the moment. In many cases, authorities that are investing in the public realm, in the kind of streetscaping and design, trying to create more attractive environments, wanting to bring people back or maintain footfall and the vibrancy of these areas. 
traditionally the only way of uh, measuring the kind of use of these spaces has been through manual uh, survey or perhaps manual coding from CCTV. We were interested in kind of working on the development of um, automated uh, technologies for looking at uh, the impacts of some of these investments, looking at how people use public spaces. And so we are uh, working with Glasgow City Council to install uh, object detection software into the CCTV system. And this sort of ranges a lot, this, this creates lots of interesting challenges. There are really interesting data science challenges around the appropriate uh, object detection uh, tools to use, how to train these, how to improve them. Um, we want to make sure we're using open source tools because then we can provide a protocol uh, which others can use in practice. But we also have to work within the constraints of the uh, CCTV center. These images are quite high quality. Um, although I stress we're not doing facial recognition, uh, there is scope to recognize people in the pictures. The pictures cannot leave the CCTV center. Uh, so we have to base our analysis uh, within the systems operated already in the center. Um, we want images on a regular basis from the same, the same direction, the same shot, uh, but we can't disrupt the operations of the center. So how do we have a protocol for the cameras which can be, um, you know, which can be managed by staff in the center who are responsible for public safety above all? Um, how do we validate the uh, data which come back and so on? So lots of interesting uh, challenges, but we're beginning to get data flowing out of this system. Um, we were live before lockdown started on a few cameras on a kind of pilot basis. And you can see again from the picture on the right-hand side, just how much footfall in the city center dropped off initially, but you know, it was beginning to recover uh, in, the, in the later months and through to July, I think at the end there. And that's great again for feedback to the local authority. They've been really excited and during lockdown, we rolled, we rolled up from four to and nearly 40 cameras now uh, across the city, covering parks, covering suburban high streets and, and, and so on. Uh, but for our longer term purposes, the real interest is in trying to use the cameras to look at how footfall changes in a kind of before and after evaluation uh, of investments in the public realm, which the council is in the process of making. So that's five different examples and the kind of data that we're working with. And I hope they uh, illustrate um, the work that we're doing. Uh, just to kind of finish off then, I think what I've tried to say um, through this, uh, through these examples is that uh, I, I really value the, the partnership we have with data scientists. It's been for me as a social scientist, it, you know, hugely beneficial to work in this multidisciplinary collaboration. Uh, but we face a lot of challenges in doing that. The technical challenges, the, the, the challenges of, 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 of collecting, managing, uh, processing, analyzing data, we can largely solve. Um, and our data science, because we have you know, that data science expertise, um, and indeed the data scientists have brought to us ideas and opportunities we hadn't even thought about as social scientists. But what makes it powerful or, or what stops it from being more powerful are, the, are range, these range of other challenges, the financial barriers arising from private ownership of many of these data, the legal challenges about copyright law and some of the gray areas in copyright law, which I haven't talked about, but which are a, an issue for us. The ethical challenges of ensuring that data are high quality, measuring what we want to measure, give a valid representation of it. And then the political challenges of working with government and public agencies and persuading them that, you know, of the value of data and of evidence. Um, so the funding we've had to, uh, as a multidisciplinary centre has been hugely uh, important. Um, and more generally, the kind of investment which the research councils and others are making in a public infrastructure uh, for accessing big data, I think supports, it, it, it supports our work and we also support the work of many others as well. So I think that's hugely benef beneficial in improving access for lots of researchers to do research in the public interest. Uh, and I hope that continues. My, 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 final, uh, my final observation uh, uh, on this, and I, I will stop, uh, is that um, I think Roman made a similar point as well. It, it, it's, a, it's an ill wind that blows nobody any good. I mean, the pandemic has had uh, appalling uh, you know, social consequences um, for, you know, at an individual and a kind of collective level. 
but there's no doubt that it's driven a step change in the way in which government uh, uses data, thinks about data, uh, manages and makes available data. And just uh, two weeks ago, the government also published a national data strategy, recognizing this step change uh, and committing to uh, a further radical transformation in the future. It's committing not to, to, to not backsliding, um, to not losing the gains that have been made in data access and use in this period, but building on them and pushing through in government greater use of data. So I think there are the opportunities here are only going to increase. Uh, and the need for you know, excellent uh, data scientists is only going to increase uh, as well. So thank you very much for your, for your time uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Nick. Well, there's at least one good news about the pandemic that data scientists are now being even more needed, which is great. Uh, the great news for, the, for our community uh, and also, thanks so much for uh, for your fantastic talk. Uh, I think it, it's interesting uh, to see uh, the Urban Big Data Center is going through the whole cycle of uh, a data science process. And, and, and as, as you mentioned, you're talking, you, you're dealing with crawling the data, processing the data, cleaning the data, and, and even you go one step further to to kind of validate the data make sure that it actually represents the real population and, and as well as there's no bias in that in terms of sampling. These are all the key things that as a data scientist we should be aware of and mindful of. Um, but also talking about the privacy and anonymization and talking about the legal aspect of the data uh, as well as cost and licensing. It also it just brings the bigger picture of, of, of how the, the impact of the data science. Okay, yes, we, we get the data, we get the features, we get some insights, and there's a bigger picture there. And, and I really enjoyed that. Thank you so much for, for, for presenting that to us. Um, and also the range of works that you're doing. So we have time for a question um, from the audience. Uh, okay, so I, I'm just gonna ask a quick question. So uh, I, I'm aware that you guys have collected, as, as you also presented, a, a numerous data. If the data science community wants to get in touch and use this data, what's the procedure? Is that something that they should be done? Uh, absolutely. I mean, the data we have uh, come with, uh, as you would expect, a, a range of different license conditions. Some of the data we can make available as open data. Uh, some of the data are licensed and therefore require users to uh, accept license conditions themselves, so we, you, could, you, you sign an end user license before being given access to them. Other data we've accessed uh, under data sharing agreements with local authorities where it's more personal or confidential data. We can't uh, pass the data on to you, but we can help you negotiate the data, license, the data sharing process uh, in turn. So we have different uh, ways of helping you access data. If you go on UBDC's website, which is ubdc.ac.uk, uh, then you can find our data catalog uh, and find the um, click on the, the, the relevant uh, links to work out how to how you might then access different data that you might be interested in. So it's, it's a kind of a, a whole range of different approaches, but you know, that we are here to help a range of different users use data. Excellent. So if you want data in this domain, which is very fantastic and, and flourishing domain, go to ubdc.com and, 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 and then you will get access to data. I just want to thanks again, both of our keynote speakers, uh, Nick and Roma, for the two fantastic keynote talks representing two different uh, uh, applications of data science and really uh, domains that are flourishing. One is digital health, the other one is urban uh, science. So just thanks again. Uh, for both of the keynote speakers, and that concludes our session. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, everyone else. Bye.